Hey guys, James Smith here, ready to take you to the next level. That's our new series. For the next three weeks, we're going to talk about what it takes to go to the next level. I don't know if you're truly happy with who you are and where you're at, but actually, I find it rare to find anybody that's really, really satisfied with who they are. You know, finding out what your weaknesses are and learning about what's holding you back is a little bit like peeing your pants. Once you realize that something is wrong, it's really time to change, and it feels awkward until you do. And sure, you know somebody out there that's got that attitude shell on where they kind of try and play it off like, oh, everything's fine, you know, I, I don't have anything wrong with me or anything wrong in my life, I don't know what you're talking about. But, but truthfully, if there's a weakness, they know it, everybody else knows it, and they know that everybody else knows it. And they're desperate to see something change. They may just not know what to do about it. And maybe neither do you, you know. The truth is, I'm talking to anybody this morning who wishes they had a greater level of peace inside or a greater ability to relate with people or a, a higher level of wisdom in your decisions or skills or maybe a higher level of spiritual power than you've experienced before. Maybe you don't have any idea what I'm talking about when I say that, but you should kick around for the next couple of weeks anyway because I may just clear that up for you. You know, a lot of us have ideas of the caliber of person that we would like to become, that we actually believe somewhere deep down inside we have the potential to become, the God-given destiny even to become. Don't you want to be the kind of person that people perk their ears up and want to hear advice from? Or don't you want to be the kind of mom that other moms could, you know, learn something from that would, that would really benefit from? Maybe you wish that you were the kind of person that had the reputation where, where people really stopped and took note of what you did in a certain situation. Or, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, you wish you were the kind of people the kind of person, excuse me, that people come to with just all kinds of questions and, and hope to hear something from you, affirmation. Maybe you just wish you were a really encouraging person to be around. Uh, I don't know what it is that you hope that you could be and expect that maybe you should be, but we all have ideas about what our next level should look like. And what I want to tell you this morning is that if you have something that you're struggling and struggling and struggling with and hitting your you know, proverbial head on the proverbial ceiling over and over and over again about, I just want to say there may be something that you've been missing. It's probably not what you think. I don't know about you, but when I keep hitting my head on the same ceiling again and again, I don't start asking, what am I missing? I usually look around for whose fault that it is. I mean, isn't that real? I didn't have to be taught that. It's like I came prepackaged from the factory to think like that and to look for somebody to blame for why I'm not making it any farther than I am. Whose fault is it that nothing has changed? Whose fault is it that this relationship is still like this? Whose fault is it that you know, I'm being held back at the job? Whose fault is it that no one has offered me another opportunity? Whose fault, whose fault, whose fault? And you know, the greatest the greatest person to absorb the blame is the devil. Oh, I love to blame the devil for things. Now, maybe you don't even believe there's a devil. I believe there's a devil, and many of you do believe that there's a devil. I'm telling you, I think the devil loves to accept responsibility for the things that haven't gone forward in our lives. In fact, if I was the devil, I would invite that because here's the thing, if the devil is at fault for everything, that means that we're powerless to change anything. So I'm sure that the devil actually welcomes the blame. Now maybe it's not the devil for you, maybe it's just your husband because your husband's such a goofball and he, he never makes it easy enough for you to make the changes that you need to make, or maybe it's the co-workers at work or the dishonest guy down the street, who knows who it is for you. But if you're really not that frustrated with where you are, then I think it's a great idea to stick right with that plan and keep looking for someone to blame. But if you are frustrated enough to want to keep listening and go a little farther, then I've got something for you that you may have been missing all along. And it has to do with unanswered questions. I don't know if you've read the Bible very much. Some of you have, some of you haven't. But I'm going to share something that I have learned about God 
through reading God's Word within the Bible. And, and it's this. God tells people lots of things throughout people's experiences. Old Testament, New Testament, everything inside of those things. He tells a lot of things. But he also asks a lot of questions. And there's something special about when God asks a question. Something really powerful takes place when God puts a question out there and it's hanging in the air for you to answer. I want to share something with you this morning from the New Testament, from John's Gospel, that is the perfect example of what takes place when God asks a question. And I'm going to take you to the end of John's Gospel. It's actually John 21. And it's just after Jesus has died and then been resurrected. Everybody thought it was all over. All of Jesus' disciples, students in training, so to speak, his volunteer recruits, have, have all gone through this wild ride where they joined on with Jesus and left their life just kind of sitting there on hold. And they went with Jesus, and he brought his message all over the countryside and brought them along to share and practicing this, this mission that he wanted to bring to the earth. He's, he's carrying out this mission to bring his message of repentance and forgiveness and salvation. And so they've gone through this incredible ride where Jesus has been arrested and then crucified and they thought it was all over. And all of a sudden now it's not over. And Jesus is back. And so his fellow disciples, his students, are all kind of, kind of hanging out wondering, what's next? I mean, now what? And this is where we find this, this story picking up. John is remembering that they were all back in their hometown. They were fishing. And John wrote that Simon Peter said to them, Simon Peter, the most anxious, gung-ho disciple of all the disciples, doesn't know what to do. He says, I'm going fishing. And so a bunch of them go out with him. And, it, and it's written that that night they caught nothing. I mean, literally not one fish. And that's important. And so they, at dawn, they are not very far out from the shore, about, about 100 yards, and they look on the beach and they see a figure on the beach, which is kind of strange, but they don't know who it is. And so it's written, the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. It's Jesus. They just they didn't know. They couldn't tell. They weren't expecting him to drop in. And it says, Jesus said to them, children, don't you have any fish? You don't have any fish, do you? They said, no, no, we don't. We don't even have actually one fish, not even one fish. This is what Jesus says. He says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Oh, of course, you know. <laughs> we were fishing off the wrong side of the boat all night. That's got to be it. But they're so used to strange occurrences like this now since they've lived with Jesus for a couple or three years at least. And, and so... They just they go for it. They don't know that it's Jesus, but hey, maybe it's Jesus, and so why not? We've been out all night anyway. They put the nets down the other side of the boat, and of course, they bring in a haul. It's pre pretty much too big to even haul in. They have to have a bunch of help getting it in. And, and it's written that when Peter, Peter figured out what was happening, when he saw that fish, he knew it was Jesus. He knew it was Jesus. And Peter being Peter... Seeing that big haul, he was out there fishing. It was his idea in the first place to fish. Doesn't even care about the fish. He is so excited to go get with Jesus and to find out and hear about what's next and ask him questions and, and see what Jesus is ready to do now. I mean, Peter struggled more than anybody to sit tight and be patient and not be anxious. Peter, it says, he threw himself into the sea, just throws, him, throws himself right into the sea, starts swimming. Can't wait for the boats to turn and, and head out. He's got to swim. He gets there. He's first. And it's written that as they get to the beach, all of the rest of them finally get to the beach. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus says, bring some of the fish you just caught and come and have breakfast. Of course, maybe that wasn't Peter's real plan, but, but you know, if Jesus tells you to come and do something 
Peter was pretty used to just kind of going along with the flow. After all, if you had resurrected yourself from the dead, people would probably take you pretty seriously, take you at your word. And so that's what Simon Peter has learned to do. And, and after breakfast, after Jesus has laid this whole thing out, come when he knew that they couldn't catch any fish, and then given them this miracle of a huge, huge catch, almost too big to even get to the beach, and, and he's got breakfast all prepared. They finish eating. It's as though Jesus has set this whole thing up to address Peter and ask him a very pointed question. And he says this, and this is a pretty famous little, little piece of scripture here, but, but don't let the fame you know, gloss your eyes over and, and not let you see what's really going on here. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, Peter, <laughs> Peter could be seen as a little bit arrogant in this moment, but, but if you've read anything of Peter and his gung-ho nature and how excited he gets and, and how he's always the first one to defend the Lord and the first one to jump up and say, I will never, I will never forsake you, you know that Peter believed in his heart that he, he really loved the Lord more than any of the other guys. His passion was higher than any of the other guys. His, his readiness to jump up and raise his hand and volunteer was greater than any of the other guys. Peter, do you love me more than these? Pointed question. Of course, Peter, Peter says, yes, yes, I do. Of course, you know I love you. He probably doesn't even understand why he's being asked this question. It probably feels a little insulting. And, and Jesus says, then tend my lambs. Take responsibility for my people that I've come and sacrificed for myself. I want you to take personal responsibility for all of my people. And he just lets it lay there. Just lets it lay there. And then just a little bit later, he comes out and just asks Peter the question a second time, Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you love me? Of course, Peter, Peter says, of course, of course, you know that I love you, of course. And he says the same thing, just a slightly different way. He says, then shepherd my sheep. Take responsibility for my people. Of course, Peter Peter wants to go to the next level. He, he's always wanted to go to the next level ever since he joined this team. And, and so, you know, his head is, is just winding and winding and winding at speed. And, and, and Jesus asks him another time, he said, Simon, do you love me? Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? Do you really love me? Then, then tend my sheep. Tend my sheep. You know, Peter, Peter had more drive than, than probably any of the other guys. I think, hands down, he had more drive. He thought of himself as being driven. He carried himself as being driven. He was so ready all the time to move to the next level. If he'd been sound asleep and the other guys had been awake and Jesus said, who's ready to move to the next level? Peter would have just sprung up like from the dead and just raced and he would have somehow like a shot been right there at Jesus' feet first. That's the kind of guy Peter wanted to be. And yet, since all of this craziness has happened, Peter is confused and he feels stuck and he just wants to know What's next? How do I get to the position? How do I get to the level I've wanted to attain for so long? The place of importance, the place of authority. God's left hand or right hand man. And Jesus is asking him a question that doesn't sound like it's related at all. But here's the thing about Jesus' question. See, Jesus asks a question that leads to a step. If Peter answers Jesus' question, Jesus' question will take Peter to the next step that Peter needs to take in order to get to the place he actually has always wanted to get to. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, 
the way to your next step in your destiny of being my follower, of being important in the kingdom as a leader is to take full responsibility for the people that I love so dearly. To treat them like their future is your future. To treat them like their life is as important as your life. To treat them like everything about them is something that I personally care so much about. Peter, do you love me? Because if you do, if you do, you'll care as passionately as I do about the future of this band of new believers who's joined on and said, I want to be part of the kingdom. You'll take responsibility for them. And actually, it's the acceptance of that responsibility that will take you to the very place that you've been hankering to get to all of these years now that you've been with me. This is actually the only way for you to become a great leader, is if you look at these people with the same kind of love and willing to sacrifice that I have looked at them with, this is the only way for you to become a leader built in my own image. But Peter wouldn't have gotten there if Jesus hadn't posed that question and driven it home three times to prove how serious he really was. Jesus says to Peter, I know you're serious. I know you wish to go farther. I know you want to become a greater man, a more important man, a man with more authority, more influence, more power, more weight. So I'm asking you this question, do you love me? If you do, it's only natural for you to take this next step in your journey. This is what's going to take you to the next place in your path. And you can't get there unless you first walk through that question with me for real. And he won't let him answer it in passing. He asks it three times in such a pointed way. It's so important that you answer this question and cross that threshold, Peter. What does that look like for you and me? I know that not all of us have had the opportunity to sit on a beach with Jesus where he's prepared breakfast for us and just sitting there waiting with the fire already toasty and, and got the fish pretty much ready to eat. I don't know, wrapped in foil. I don't know what they look like. I don't even know how to cook fish on a charcoal fire. I, I freely admit that. But I've got friends that do, so I don't have to do that. But, but I know most of us haven't had that experience. Uh, but here's the thing. God still does and can answer excuse me, ask and answer questions. Now, for some of you, God uses a person. Sometimes it's a preacher. Sure, I ask questions, and I actually believe that God uses me to have God ask you pointed questions that will lead to a next step in your life. Sometimes it's a preacher, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just the people around you. Sometimes it's not the people you'd expect at all, but still, God uses people to ask his pointed questions at you. How do you know if it's a God question? I'll tell you the first sign I think you'll see is when somebody asks you a question, uh, why do you do that? Why do you want this? Why do you, or how do you think this is going to pan out? Or, you know, where, where do we draw the line? Or they, they ask you a question, and you, you are annoyed by the question because if you were going to answer that question honestly, it would actually put you in a place that leads to a, a change, and it makes you uncomfortable. You don't want to be faced with it, and so, uh, you know, you, you bristle, you, you have tension inside every time somebody asks you that question, and what will really give you a, a tip is when you have numerous people in your life sort of an, asking, excuse me, asking that same question that creates that tension inside. Why, why do you keep doing this, or why why don't you consider doing this differently? Or why do you treat this person this way? You know, when that happens again and again and again, I'm telling you, that's a sign it's a God question. If you feel that if you had to answer that question honestly, and it would have to logically lead to a change in your behavior, I'm telling you, that's probably God asking you a question. That doesn't mean you'll answer it, but it, it could be God asking you a question. Sometimes it doesn't come from a person 
that you see and hear. Sometimes, sometimes you can be reading, you know, hungry for an answer of some kind, and you'll read the actual words that Jesus wrote, just like you and I have looked at today, and where Peter is asking, excuse me, asking Jesus things, and Jesus asking Peter things. You know, maybe you read and. Uh, God asks a question of one of the people in the story and it's a question that resonates with you and you kind of just feel natural to put yourself in the same position as that person and ask, what if it was me? How would I answer? Could I answer? What would I say? What's real? Sometimes, sometimes when you're praying, God will ask you a question. I don't mean the rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub kind of prayer, or checking off a list, oh, thanks for this, thanks for that, I've I got to get going, God, I'll see you again at 5 o'clock. I'm talking about the kind of prayer where you really just open yourself up, no hurry, and are just kind of putting everything of yourself out on the table, all of your tensions, all of your questions, the things that are bothering you, and you just allow God moments of time to, to give you something, to do anything that he wants to do, really. Sometimes you'll spend some time like that with God and just all of a sudden you'll be, you'll be thinking or, or praying or maybe you sing when you, when you pray. You know, maybe you have a little prayer and worship time of your own in your quiet time, I don't know. But you'll have a question come in your mind. It's just there. You didn't think it. You didn't put it there. You didn't logic your way up to it. It just is there. And it begs an answer. It may even make you uncomfortable, but there it is. And something in you knows that's a very important question. And if you were to go through the work of answering that question, it would actually lead you to a realization that you've been needing. God can ask a question in a number of ways. The important part is not how he asks it, but whether or not we choose to answer. You know, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes when people put me on the spot and and they give me a question like that, I kind of avoid and evade, you know. I'm not really comfortable answering that question right now, so I'm not going to say yes, I'm not going to say no, I'll just say uh, maybe, or IDK, I don't know, or maybe later, sometime in the future, possibly. You know, I, I don't want to give a yes or no answer to the question. But uh, I'm telling you, one time my kids actually called me out on this, and had told me, this is really dumb. This is not good at all. Uh, I don't know what the question was anymore. They asked me, hey, you know, can we do this? I think it was, can we get a four-wheeler or something like that? Can we buy a four-wheeler? I want a four-wheeler. And, you know, I did the standard dad reflex thing. I pulled out my dad magic eight ball of answers, and I just said something like, well, not right now. Or, eh, maybe, but just, just not right now. It's not, you know... And, and they actually just called me right out and said, they said, you know, why don't you, why don't you just say no? You know, it would actually be easier if you just said no. <laughs> because that's what you actually mean when you say that. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, but, but seriously, but seriously, most of the time when we avoid a question, when we avoid saying yes or no, and we say, oh, maybe, possibly, maybe later, or something else from your magic eight ball of answers, what we're really doing is just fooling ourselves into thinking that maybe circumstances could change between now and whenever it is that you might actually make a change, and somehow it'll be easier, or maybe something will be different, or you'll feel differently, or you'll have a better idea then. But the truth is, you're just putting off owning your no. See, if we said yes, it would just be yes, and that would be it. But when it comes to a no, we often feel so guilty about just saying no. No, I'm not willing to do that. No, I wouldn't do that if you asked me to, God. No, I don't want to change how I think. I don't want to change my heart about that person. No, I don't want to humble myself about that matter. I want to be right. No, I, I, just, I just don't want to. But rather than saying no and just owning it and being confident in it and, and being for real what we are inside, we'd rather just say, oh, let me think about that and I'll come back to it later, God. Or, well, I don't feel that way about it now, but hey, 
maybe I'll feel differently in a year or two. The truth is, the truth is we're taking an incredible risk by not owning our no because we're actually fooling ourselves by pretending, by pretending that we might actually even mean yes. And the truth is we, we really don't. I don't know where you're at and I don't know what question God has asked you. I don't know what ceiling you're hitting your head on over and over again. I don't know what your next level looks like. But what I can tell you is that if you have an unanswered question from God just hanging out there, I would bank, I would absolutely bank that you will not make your next level until you give God the answer to that question that he's posed to you. Will you do fill in the blank, yes or no? Are you ready to start fill in the blank, yes or no? Are you ready for this discipline now? Yes or no? Are you ready to leave this thing that you've been doing and start doing the new thing that I've asked you to do? Yes or no? Maybe you don't actually know of a question specifically that God has asked you. Or maybe, maybe you think he did, but honestly you've put it off for so long, you don't even remember what the question was. I've got good news for you. I can ask you the question. (laughs) I can ask you a pointed question from God right now. Are you willing to get hungry to find out what it takes to get past the level that you're at? Are you ready to invite God to come in and just renovate your life right down the foundations? Are you ready to just avail yourself to Jesus to be your Lord? Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've asked Jesus to be your Lord, but maybe you have rooms in your house, so to speak, where you haven't invited Jesus into to look and ask questions and shine light on. Maybe you have places like that. So my question to you would be, are you ready to let Jesus be the Lord of all of the areas of your life, not just a certain section that you're comfortable inviting him in? I think those are great questions, and they may even be God's question for you today. So what I'm going to do this morning is pray, just like I always do. I always pray at the end of the messages. But this is, this is a special prayer, because this is a prayer that invites God to come in and re-ask the question if he needs to. And it's a prayer to give you the strength to step forward and, and take the step that leads to the next step, to the next level. And so I'm inviting you to join me in a special prayer this morning, wherever you're at, whether it's upstairs in the shower or whether you're in your car driving on your way to work because you're an essential worker or or maybe you're hiding out in the basement waiting for all of this to, to be over with. I don't know where you're at this morning, but this is a great moment to just stop and pause and ask God to ask you a question or to say yes to the question because you already know what it is. So here we go, and you join me as best you can, wherever you are right now. God, we invite you this morning to be our Father. Today, more than yesterday, be our Father. To be our Lord. To absolutely rule with authority like a king over our lives, like we're your subjects, because That's what we want to be. We want to be your subjects. We want to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So we invite you right now to be our Lord and we give you free reign to ask the questions that you want to ask us because we don't want to live in frustration. We don't want to stay where we're at. We want to become all of who you intended us to become. We deeply sense our potential at times. We see the things inside us, the passions, the excitement, the, the, the desperate need to see things change around us, to influence and to lead and to, and to see things happen, to see miracles happen, power. We want to see things move forward in our lives, Lord. But we invite you this morning to ask the questions that you want to ask and to be our Lord. And we think of those questions that we know you've asked us in the past and maybe we've avoided you. Maybe we kind of put you off. Maybe, 
Maybe we kind of pretended that we didn't really totally understand the question. Or maybe we thought, oh, I'll just I'll get a little bit more clarity over time. And maybe it was just a rhetorical question. Maybe it wasn't meant to be answered. But we know that when you ask a question, you expect an answer. And you expect that if we answer, the answer will take us to the next step we need to take. And so right now, God, I pray for those of us who feel convicted that we've left your questions unanswered. Right now, God, that we would take that, that, that tiny but so important step of just saying, yes. If, if the, the question needed a yes, then, then we pray yes this morning. If the question took a, will you go or will you come or will you do this, then we just want to pray this morning a yes because we know that that was the right answer and it will lead us to where we need to go next. If you asked us about, about what we feel or think or how we should view other people, we want to we speak up this morning with whatever that right answer was in that certain situation, whether it should have been, yes, I do need to forgive them, or yes, I do need to think more of them than I do of myself, or yes, I do need to consider what will happen if I make this, this move. We just want to pray yes together in unity. Yes, yes, <laughs> you're right, God. Yes, I can see where you're going with this. Yes, and to just let that affirmative take us to the next logical place that you mean to take us to that realization, the conclusion that we need to land. God, we want to go to the next level and we know that we need you to take us there. So God, we invite you this morning to take us to the next level. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Taste it.